Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to Chapter 30 of House in the Scorpion, When the Whales Lost Their Legs. <sighs> One thing was certainly true. Something did paralyze their sense of smell in this place, because Matt no longer noticed the foul air. The food tasted better, too. Not good, but not totally disgusting, either. Day after day, he, Chacho, and Fidelidio walked along the row of shrimp tanks and cleaned out bugs. Every evening, they trudged back to a meal of plankton burgers or plankton pasta or plankton burritos. Carlos never seemed to run out of ideas for things to do with plankton. When the growing cycle was over, Tauntaun came out with a huge, slow-moving harvester. It groaned along like an arthritic dinosaur and dumped the contents of the tanks into its cavernous belly. Matt filled them again from a pipe running out of the Gulf of California. At the far western end of the shrimp farm, the boys could look through the fence at the channel that had once been as wide as the sea. It was a deep blue with hordes of seagulls. Chacho balanced on the rim of the tank to get a better view. The lower part of the fence was safe to touch, although the top wire buzzed and popped with electricity. Fidelidio stretched his arm through the meshes, though he could touch the enticing blue if he only tried a little harder. Matt searched for weak places in the mesh. Escape was never far from his mind. What's that? asked Chacho, pointing north. Matt shaded his eyes. He saw something white peeping over through the fold in the ground. Doesn't look like trees, said Chacho. Want to take a look? The sun was beginning to lower in the west, but the lure of something new was too great to resist. This is going to take a while. You wait here, Matt told Fidelidio. He knew the little boy didn't have the strength for an extra walk. You can't leave me. We're compadres, said Fidelidio. We need you to guard our stuff, said Chacho. If anyone tries to steal it, kick them where I showed you. Fidelidio grinned and sal saluted like a midget commando. Matt and Chacho walked over a landscape even more desolate than the area near the salt works. There, if it rained, a few stunted weeds struggled to the surface. Here there was nothing except white patches of salt. Seashells dotted the surface, evidence of living sea that had once stretched out from horizon to horizon. Maybe it's only a salt bed, said Chacho. As they got closer, Matt saw odd shapes thrusting up. Some were paddle-like, others were thin, thin and curved, and it was the strangest thing he'd ever, ever seen. They came up a straight rise and looked out over a deep chasm. It was filled from side to side with bones. For a few moments, Chacho told Matt and stood. Chacho and Matt stood on the edge of the chasm and said nothing. Finally, Chacho murmured, "Someone lost a heck of a lot of cattle down there." "Those aren't cattle," said Matt. The skulls were huge and the jaws shaped like monster bird beaks. One rib alone was larger than a was longer than a cow. Mixed in with them was paddle-like bones, massive enough to make tables or even beds. So many skeletons were jumbled together, Matt couldn't begin to count them. He guessed there were hundreds. Thousands. Isn't that a human skull? said Chacho. Matt squinted out the shadowy part squinted out of the shadows part way down and saw that Chacho was pointing at. Think about it, the big boy said. If someone fell in there, he'd never get out. Matt thought about it. He had been about to explore the pit, stepping from bone to bone like climbing down a large tree. Now he knew that the whole pit was de delicately balanced. Put one foot in the wrong place and the whole structure would collapse. He clenched his teeth and sickened behind me. He clenched his teeth, sickened behind what he had almost done. We'd better go back, said Chacho. We don't want Philodido poking around here. Philodido had been entertaining himself by splashing his feet in a shrimp tank. He draped a net over his head for sunshade. What was it? He called to Matt and Chacho. Matt described the bones, and to his surprise, the little boy recognized them. They're whales, said Fidelidio. Eight of them beached themselves where I lived in Ch Yucatan. They swam right up on shore and couldn't get back. Miabaluta said that it was because they used to walk on land and had forgotten they didn't have legs anymore. Fuchi, yuck. They smelled like Jorge's sneakers. The villagers had to bury them in the sand. Fidelidio chirped and warbled about rotting whales all the way back to the factory. Anything to do with his grandmother got him going. What could have lured all those whales to their deaths, thought Matt, thought Matt as they trudged along the shrimp tanks. 
Maybe the chasm was still full of water when the Gulf of California dried up. Maybe the whales decided to wait there until rains came to fill the gulf again. Only it didn't fill up, and the whales had lost their legs, so they couldn't walk home anymore. Every night, Jorge told the bedtime story and afterward invited the boys to confess sins. And every night, the boys, led by Tauntaun, hurled accusations at Matt. It was meant to humiliate him, but the odd thing is that the attacks hurt less the longer they went on. Matt thought it was like listening to a barnyard full of turkeys. El Patron sometimes ordered dozens of the ridiculous birds when he was planning a party, and Matt liked to lean over the fence to watch them. Tamlin said turkeys were the stupidest birds in the world. If they were looking up when it was raining, they'd drown. At any rate, turkeys went into wild-eyed, head-banging panic when a red-tailed hawk went over. Gobble, 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 they shrieked. Even though, even though they weighed five times as much as a hawk, they could have stomped it into the ground. That was when Matt heard the boys trotted out their crimes. Gobble, 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 gobble. Matt's eyes narrowed and his mouth tightened into a thin line when Matt refused to confess, but he said nothing. I'm not sure what I said there. Jorge's eyes narrowed and his mouth tightened into a thin line when Matt refused to confess, but he said nothing. Chacho and Fidelidio quickly learned the easiest way to avoid trouble was to give the keeper what he wanted. They confessed all sorts of creative sins, and Jorge was pleased that he hardly ever punished them. Matt was especially tired this night after the walk to the whale pit. He mumbled his way through the five principles of good citizenship and the four attitudes leading to right mindfulness. He barely heard Jorge's story. It was something about how you needed all ten fingers to play a piano. The fingers had to support one another and try not to show off by being individualists. Fidelidio admitted to gagging over plank admitted to gagging over plankton milkshakes, and Chacho said he used bad words when the wake up bell went off. The keeper smiled and turned to Matt, but Matt remained silent. He knew he was being stupid. All he had to do was confess something small, but he couldn't force himself to grovel in front of Jorge. I see our aristocrat needs further education, said the keeper. His gaze passed over the assembled boys, and all at once the atmosphere changed in the room. Everyone stared down at the floor, and no one put up his hand. And no one put up his hand. Matt roused himself out of his stupor long enough to notice... You, barked Jorge to suddenly see that several boys flinched. He pointed at Tauntaun. M me squeaked Tauntaun as though he couldn't believe it. You stole a hollow game from the keeper's room, so he found it on a pile of rags in the kitchen. I, uh, I, uh. Cleaning the keeper's room is a privilege, yelled Jorge. It is earned through obedience and good behavior, but you failed in your duties. What should be done with a boy who sneaks around and takes things that the others don't have? Keepers have things the others don't have, thought Matt. He didn't say it aloud. He should work extra hard, a boy guessed. No, shouted Jorge. Maybe he can... He can apologize, someone else faltered. Haven't you learned anything? The keeper bellowed. Worker bees must think of the whole hive. If they gather nectar for themselves, they don't bring anything home, and the hive will starve when the cold weather comes. That's not what workers do. It's how drones behave. They steal from others. When winter comes, what happens to the drones? The good bees kill them, said a boy almost as small as Fidelidio. Wait a minute, thought Matt. That's right. The good bees sting the evil drones to death. Wait a minute, thought Matt. That's right. The good bees sting the evil drones to death. But we don't want to go quite that far, said Jorge. Matt let out the breath he'd been holding. In opium, murder was a casual thing. He didn't know what the rules were here. By now, Tauntaun was reduced to absolute terror, tears and snot routing down the boy's unlovely face. Matt was surprised to feel sorry for him. Tauntaun was a slimy suck-up who deserved whatever was coming. Assume the position, said Jorge. Tauntaun stumbled to a wall. He leaned against it with his arms stretched out and his arms and legs flat against the wall. He spread his legs. Remember, if you move, it'll be worse for you. Tauntaun nodded. The keeper unlocked a small storage chest and selected a cane. Matt could see that they were of all sizes. Jorge took his time in making the decision. Tauntaun whimpered softly. Finally, the keeper brought out a cane about the thickness of his thumb. He thwacked it against the bed to test its strength. Otherwise, the room was perfectly silent, except for Tauntaun's snuffles. Jorge paced back and forth. He seemed to be citing what part of Tauntaun to hit. The boy's arms and legs were trembling so hard it seemed like they'd fall off before Jorge laid a hand on him. Matt could hardly believe what was happening. 
It was so cruel, so pointless. Tantan had shown himself eager to obey. He mumbled, or he humbled himself whenever the keepers asked, but maybe that was the point. El Patron said easy target. El Patron said easy targets were opportunities to frighten enemies you weren't ready to tackle just yet. That's me, thought Pat. I'm the enemy George wants to fr Jorge wants to fight. Frighten. The keeper suddenly broke off his pacing and hurled himself across the room. At that very instant, Tonton panicked and ran. Jorge was on him at once, flailing away, hitting everything he could reach. He struck again and again until blood flew off the cane. Fidelidio scrambled over to bury his face in Matt's chest. Finally, the keeper stepped back, panting and point pointed the boys cowering near the door. Take him to the infirmary, he ordered. The boys scurried to obey. They dragged Tonton limp as a rag from the room. Jorge propped a cane against the bed and wiped his face with a towel. No one moved or spoke. Everyone looked too terrified to even breathe. After a moment, Jorge looked with the kindly expression of a beloved teacher. The fury had drained from his face as completely as it had once drained from Tom's face, and the change was even more frightening than rage. I think our young aristocrat has understood the lesson, he said gently. Well, Matt, do you have any personal shortcomings you'd like to share? No, said Matt, pushing Fidelidio out of harm's way. Everyone gasped. I beg your pardon? I haven't done anything wrong. Matt understood the lesson all right. It was this. Even slavish obedience couldn't protect you from punishment. I see, sighed the keeper. Then there's no help for it. Assume the position. I don't see how it makes any difference, Matt said. You beat up Tonton when he was lying on the floor. Do it. It makes things easier. Someone dared to whisper. Jorge whirled around but didn't catch who spoke. Matt stood with his arms crossed. Inside he was quaking with fear, but outside he gave the keeper as cold and imperious a look as El Patron had ever mustered to terrify an underling. Some boys, Jorge said in a thin, almost wheedling voice. That sent chills down Matt's back. Some boys have to learn the hard way. They have to be broken and mended and broken again until they learn what they're to do what they're told. It may be simple, like sweeping a floor, but they do it eagerly to keep from being broken again, and they do it forever as long as they live. In other words, you told you turn them in you want to turn me into a zombie, said Matt. No, cried several voice cried out several voices. How dare you accuse me of that, Jorge soon reach for the cane. I'll confess for him. I'll do it, shrieked Phil at Edio, running to the center of the room. He dropped the soap in the shower and didn't put a, pick it up again. He threw away porridge because there was a stink bug in it. Phil at Phil at Fiddle Edio, you idiot, groaned Chacho. He did those things. Honest, cried the little boy. George Jorge looked from Philodidio to Matt with an interest in his eyes. Go sit down, Matt said in a low voice. Stop, shouted the keeper. I say we have a social contamination of the worst order here. The aristocrat has turned this bully into his lackey, unless it is the lackey who should be punished. A beating would kill him, said Matt. No one is too learned to learn no one is too little to learn the value of education, Jorge said. Why, even child kings used to be thrashed until they learned not to cry at public meetings, as young as six months of age. He's got me, said Matt, thought Matt. No matter how much he wanted to resist Jorge's authority, he couldn't do it at the little boy's expense. Very well, I confess, said Matt. I dropped the soap in the shower and didn't pick it up again. I threw away the porridge because there was a stink bug in it. And, the keeper said pleasantly, I peed in the shrimp tank. I peed in a shrimp tank. Don't ask me which one. I don't remember. And I left the water running in the kitchen sink. Assume the position. Matt did so, hating himself, but hating the keeper even more. He kept a stony silence as Jorge pranced around trying to work on Matt's nerves. And he didn't scream, although he wanted to very much when the man hurled himself across the room and struck him with a force that made him almost pass out with pain. He straightened up and endured another blow and another. After six blows, Jorge had decided he'd done enough. Or more likely, the keeper had exhausted his strength beating up Tonton. Matt figured he had been lucky, but he didn't doubt that more agony was just down the road. 
Jorge wasn't going to give up that easily. Matt staggered into a bunk and collapsed. He was barely aware of Jorge's departure, but in the instant the door closed, some whites scrabbled off to their beds and clustered around Matt. You were great, they cried. Jorge's such a loser, said a tall skinny boy named Flacco. Loser, Matt thought weakly. I'm the one who gave up. Chale, no way, said Flacco. Jorge crossed the line tonight. If Noose gets back of this to the keeper's headquarters, he's history. No one's going to tell him, Chacha said scornfully. This place might as well be on the moon. Soon I'll be old enough to leave, said Flacco. I'll go to headquarters and tell them. I'm not holding my breath waiting, Chacha said. Anyhow, you were muy bravo to take the beating for Philadelphia, Flacco told Matt. We thought you were a wussy aristocrat, but you're really one of us. I kept telling you that, Philid... Fidelidio piped up. Everyone started arguing about when they discovered Matt was a wussy aristocrat and when they knew he was uh, muy, muy gante, a great guy. Matt let out, oh, Matt let the warm tide of their approval flow around him. He was dizzy with pain, but it was worth it if the others liked him. Hey, we've got to get him fixed up, Flacco said. The boy checked the hallway to make sure it was clear. They carried Matt to the infirmary, where Tom and Tom was already sound asleep. A pockmarked boy in green uniform dressed Matt's wounds and measured three drops of liquid into a spoon. That's laudanum, Matt realized as his eyes caught the label on the bottle. He fought against taking the medicine. He didn't want to turn into a zombie like Felicia or die like poor Furball, but he was too exhausted to resist for long. If he died, Matt wondered as he lifted off into a drug-induced daze, would he meet Furball in whatever afterlife non-humans inhabited? And would the dog sink his teeth into Matt's ankle for taking him away from Maria? End of chapter 30. Wow, this book is getting nuts, and uh, this plankton factory and the keepers and Mexico in this book's universe is wholly insane. It is like the most insane form of communism that you could ever see. Right, see that? That's communism. Like, what you're reading in this book, that is straight-up communism. And pretty damn extreme communism, too. That's why communism isn't even perfect on paper, because things like that happen. Anyway, enough ranting, ranting about communism. I'll see you all next video.